welcome again to um, our Lenten Luncheon series. I'm Pastor Jeff Johnson here at First Lutheran. The series has been going on for about 40 years. We're so excited that it's back um, um, because of its COVID sort of rest. And um, it's great to see you all here eating this delicious food, which is prepared for us by the, the pastor's aid um, ministry here at First Lutheran. Um, today, we're very blessed and honored that our Minister of Music and Cantor, Dr. Stephen Young, is presenting today on a topic of which he is very familiar. Um, Dr. Young is um, Professor of Music at Bridgewater State University, and we're very honored to have him in our midst. Um, and he's only been with us since January, but it feels like, I'm sure he's been with us quite a wonderful and long time. So we're thrilled that, uh, that Steve is with us today. Um, some quick announcements. Uh, next week is our last Lenten lunch. We have a guest um, uh, pastor who to visit us um, from the Haitian community, and it is Swedish meatball. <laughs> so it's our last one. Um, and then we obviously are not here for a whole week. Uh, one thing I want to bring to your attention, if you have these flyers on your table, is the concert that's on April 21st, Thursday at 7 p.m. upstairs. It's a, uh, an organ and piano concert led by David Briggs, who is a very famous musician, and it's kicking off the, um, say, our Steinway piano project. Our 129-year-old instrument is um, in dire need of refurbishment, and um, uh, David Briggs is coming from New York. He's the artist in residence at St. John the Divine Cathedral and to play a, an incredible concert on both the organ and piano back in the day. Um, are there any announcements from the community? Yeah. And you have an announcement? Okay. All right. If that, uh, with that being said, let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for today and the beginnings of spring and the wonderful flowers coming up. We give you thanks today for um, uh, Steve Young and his music ministry. And we give you thanks for the food in front of us, the hands that prepare it, the hearts that prepare it. And um, be with us as we minister to others and we're present to each other at all times. All this we ask in your name that is holy. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, and please help me welcome Dr. Stephen Young. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon, and thank you again to the kitchen crew for that fabulous lunch. So I will preface this by saying, usually when I give this talk, it's to an academic community of people who really understand a little bit more about the intricacies of music. Not that I'm gonna dumb this down for you too much, but I don't want you to get too bored. So I'll try to tell some jokes and some stories, play some music for you and make it as interesting as possible. So we're talking about unsung and unperformed or unplayed heroines of French organ music. The history of, organ, of music in general, but organ music especially, has three basic areas in which it spent most of its time. The early music we associate with Bach and Buxtehude came from North Germany, that region of the country. In the middle of the 18th century, early 19th century, things moved to Vienna, where Beethoven, Haydn, and Mozart we're doing all of the performing and writing of the great music that existed. In the 1900s, somewhere around 1850, 1875, France became the center of musical activity, especially for the organ, but for many other things as well. So my research work is in the area of French composers of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, most of it was done on male composers, but at one point I thought, you know, there must be women out there somewhere, and there are. So. So France has had a long history of producing some of the finest organists and composers of music since the, um, since the time of Bach. Composers such as Francois Couperin, Nicolas de Grigny, and Louis Clarambeau were among the earliest whose music is still performed today. In the 19th and 20th centuries, names such as Alexandre Guimont, Charles-Marie Vidor, Louis Vierne, and Marcel Dupré, all men who dominated the music landscape of the time. But where are the women? There are many female organist composers in France's rich history whose names have escaped us. A few may be known, such as Cécile Chaminad or Augusta Holmes, but they are truly the exceptions. This talk will introduce you to some of the unsung heroines of organ composition. 
Additionally, you will learn of the remarkable odds they overcame to achieve their goals despite the lack of recognition by most of the musical public. This is Edviga Chrétien. She was born in 1859 and died in 1944. She enjoyed a career as both performer and composer, did a brief stint as a professor of solfege or sight singing at the conservatoire. She was respected by her teachers as Theodore Dubois, who was the director of the conservatory at one time, called her a perfect musician. She was mostly known as a pianist and a performer at the piano. She spent most of her time doing all of that. It wasn't until the 1920s that she began to focus on music for the organ. Uh, she was over 60 at the time. Um, her music seems to have been designed primarily for religious and educational use, not the concert hall. Um, so if you want a little dish, a little gossip about poor Edviga, she was married to a flutist named Paul Gennaro. Apparently Gennaro had a mental instability, put it that way. At one point they were having issues in their marriage and so she went and went to live near her mother. Her mother was shacking up with some guy named Paul Lamy at the time because she was divorced probably to or, or widowed, whatever it happened to be, you know, French or that way. Um, <laughs> And so Lamy and Edviga would talk regularly about the situation at home, and he basically encouraged her to leave him. So Gennaro got wind of this, went out and bought two guns, tracked down Mr. Lamy, and shot him nine times at a train station. Luckily, he was a bad shot, so Lamy survived. But anyway, so. Clearly, this led to the divorce of Gennaro and Chrétien. So now Chrétien in 1900 is divorcing from her husband. France, as a Catholic country, does not look happily on people who get divorced. So she had to deal with that stigma through most of her career. But nonetheless, her music, because it was so good and such high quality, was being published by the Procure Générale, which was the Catholic publishing company of the time. So she really did manage to overcome this sort of nasty experience uh, as a result of that. So it was kind of fun. Um, in 1926, she published probably the best of her organ pieces called Le March Funèbre, or the Funeral March. Uh, it was said of it, it enjoyed a distinction of style, clarity of writing, purity and richness of harmony, melodic charm, joined to a sincere religious expression. The work pays tribute to her teacher, César Franck. I should tell you about Franck in a minute. Uh, as the opening measures sound reminiscent of the Dizium Chorale that he wrote for organ. César Franck was the organ professor at the conservatory from the 1870s on. He was the only professor at the conservatory to allow women into the organ class. Up until about 1900, the classes were separated. Men and women had separate entrances. They had separate things they could study. Franck was the only professor to allow women to join the organ class. So here's a little bit of the Chrétien Martrenet. <laughs> There it goes on for about seven minutes. I don't want to bore you too much. 
But you'll notice in the very beginning, I don't know how many of you read music at all, and it's not really that important, but this figure here, this da 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 came from Chopin's Games from March. So that rhythm always dominates funeral march style pieces, and so you clearly hear that in this example. By the way, this is shameless, shameless self-promotion. This is my recording of all these pieces because no one else has recorded them. Um, so they were recorded last summer at Grace uh, Episcopal Church in New Bedford, and the CD is hopefully going to be issued sometime the next year. So Next comes Mademoiselle Josephine Boulet. Uh, she was born in 1865 um, and died in 1929. She became blind at the age of three. So this is always a difficult situation. Blindness was not an uncommon thing, but it certainly happened a lot. And most of the time when a person, young person was blind, the family could not care for them, and they often were sent away to orphanages. And this was the case with Josephine. Um, her parents could not attend her needs, so she was sent to the L'Institution Nationale des Jeunes Aveugles, the young school for the young blind. And this is a place in France where students went to learn how to make a living being disabled. Music was very much a part of that educational training, and Josephine took to it like a fish to water. While at the school, she began organ studies with Louis Lebel, and upon completion, she continued her work under, again, César Franck at the Conservatoire, where she won the first prize in organ performance and improvisation in 1888, the year she entered the conservatory at the age of 19. So that alone is an accomplishment. No other student in their first year won the first prize. So that was a remarkable thing that she did. Sebastian Durand, who wrote her biography, says of her, the journey of this musician, the first blind woman to undertake high musical studies, arouses admiration. And we measure the importance of the work and efforts made by this artist to achieve such brilliant success. Let me give you a further example of this brilliance. While at school, every student has to take certain courses one of the courses that they all take is counterpoint and fugue. Now, if you know anything about counterpoint and fugue, it is a process that is just grueling for anybody who has to write one. Uh, we all had to do it in college as music students. Um, and the reason they did this was because at the conservatory, you competed every year for a prize. Every class had a prize. So the fugue prize was being offered that year. Boulet was up for that prize. Now, remember that she's blind. The way this works for the average student who's sighted is they give you a piece of music with the theme on it, and then you go and lock yourself in your room for 18 hours. So 6 a.m. to midnight, basically. And you have to come out with a brilliant fugue that then is submitted to the examiners, completely un unnamed, so blindfold judging. And then you have to get judged the next day, and they award the prize. So for the average student, they can go, they can write it out, they can make their copies, they can make their corrections, they can see it, they can look at it. Josephine did not have the luxury. She had to construct the fugue in her head, memorize it, fix all of the problems that existed, then dictate it to someone to write it out, to hand it in, all in the same 18-hour period. They made no exception for the work that she had to do being a blind woman. So she submitted her fugue at midnight like everybody else did, the next day, they named two people to win the prize. She came in first. Um, so we're, 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 this is a brilliant musical mind, a brilliant musical mind. It's just, it's just wonderful. Um, so you can understand why she is so good. She only wrote or published, I should say. This, by the way, is her diploma from the conservatory, um, showing that she won uh, prizes in organ and in other things. She only wrote three pieces for organ music that were published in her lifetime, a prelude, an andante, and a fugue. Um, if you were here on March 6th for church, you heard the prelude. Don't worry if you didn't hear it, it's okay. Um, you buy the CD, it's all right. <laughs> it is archived. Right. Um, but this andante is, is one of my favorite pieces of hers, and was the piece that she seemed to like the best and everybody else liked the best because it was published more than once in her lifetime, which again is highly unusual for any composer, never mind a blind composer. So this is a little bit of the andante by Boulet. Technology.
just keep stopping you, but otherwise we'll be here till two o'clock, and I'm sure you all have better things to do. Boulay wrote this piece in 1898, and in 1902, she gave a concert of her organ music and her core music at the school where she taught, the Institution Nationale de Genevieve, where she graduated from as well. The local musical rag called Le Menestrel called her a composer of rare merit. Uh, they truly respected the work she did and the music that she wrote, and she's a name who should be better known. But we shall move on. The next forgotten female is Marie Prestat. Unfortunately, there is no iconography I can find on this one whatsoever. But my understanding is, at least as a young person, she had fairly long hair that she used to type in a ponytail. And when she would play, she would bounce her head. So one judge commented on watching the horse race as she was performing a piece. So anyway, she was born in Paris, where she spent her entire life. She attended the conservatoire in 1885, and she shared the prize for harmony in the class for women. Over the next several years, she won first place prizes in accompaniment, counterpoint, composition, and organ performance and improvisation. The only woman to ever win all the prizes offered by the conservatory. So once again, these women are remarkable people who really need to be better known. Um, there, as I said, there's scant biographical information about her other than her birth in May of 1862. She was a distinguished student who clearly made an impression on her professors at the conservatoire, as both Jules Massenet and Alexandre Guimont spoke glowingly, glowingly of her artistic accomplishments. According to the records of the conservatoire, César Franck, her teacher, reportedly said to her, quote, no lesson interests me more than yours, unquote. An early review concurred with her teacher's judgments, setting her ability to, quote, join together musical science, charm, and brilliance, most notably in her composition, The Marche Nuptiale, composed in 1895. While she did compose early in her career, most of her published works came out between 1913 and 1917. Her organ compositions make use of homophonic textures, chromatic harmony, tripartite forms. The late Prelude and Fugue in C minor, Opus 81, which I will play a little bit of you for you now, displays a very strict disciplined style, especially in the fugue. And if you come to church on Sunday, you'll hear the prelude as the postlude. Trying to draw a business for you, Pastor. <laughs> Pause, we'll stop there and just play a little bit of the few that you can see on your screen just so again you can hear what it sounds like. Very Baroque in its style. due to time. All right, the last woman I'm going to introduce you to today is Martha Brackman. Martha is my dearest friend. She is the one who I've spent most of my time researching in the past couple of years. Just finished an article on her that is uh, about to come out next year, so I'm very happy about that. This is her playing the organ for Sal Playel. 
Martha Brackman did not do any of the things any of the women we've talked about thus far have done. She did not go to conservatory. She did not get a degree. She did not pursue education in that sense. She came from a fairly wealthy family, uh, and both sides of the family have interesting artistic backgrounds. Her mother's side of the family uh, is the Barbadette side of the family, and her grandfather was a well-known pianist and uh, historian who wrote the authoritative biography of uh, Stephen Heller, an uh, English pianist. Her mother was also a pianist. On her father's side of the family, she came from the Brackman family. If you know anything about the name Brackman, Felix Brackman was a well-known lithographer in France and brought Japanese art to Paris in the 1800s. Her mother, Marie Brackman, her, her mother, Marie Brackman, was an artist of some great renown whose works are often compared to those of Mary Cassatt and Eva Gonzalez, a true impressionistic woman uh, painter. These are two examples of the work she did. Sorry, this is her grandmother. I'm sorry if I lied just at her mother, her grandmother. Her father, Pierre, followed in the footsteps of the, the mother, also a painter, and his most famous work is this beautiful piece called Lysine, which means wisteria. Um, again, you can see a little bit of the impressionistic style in there, a little bit of the blurriness, but the vibrant colors are all there. So she's coming out of this artistic background. Apparently, the understanding is that uh, dinners with the grandparents also included some of the great artists of the day, Degas, Monet, et cetera, et cetera. So she traveled in really nice circles. Uh, as a result of this, she was able to study privately with some of the best teachers in Paris. She studied piano with Louis Vierne. She studied composition with Charles-Marie Vidor and Henri Bousset. And she studied organ with Marcel Dupré. Um, so she had quite the list of credentials on, beside her. So initially, she decided she was going to pursue a career in composition. Her very first work, a string quartet, was performed at the Société Nationale concert in the 19, early 1920s to rave reviews. Things were going really well for her. A few years later, she had another performance of a similar string piece that did not go so well. So she decided she would take another path. At that point, she decided to focus on performing. So in 1927, she gave her very first debut concert um, at the Hotel Majestique, which was a two and a half hour tour de force where she played 17 organ solos plus accompanied a singer and a bunch of songs. This was quite the event to be at. This was the event that got her published and noticed uh, in the musical magazines of the time and she became a name. A few years later, she was invited to perform on the radio series. Since 1924, when the Paris PTT Post Telegraph and Telephone Ministry existed, they had weekly concerts of the organ and George Jacob had been the organist performing those every week for many, many years. In 1933, he decided he was going to retire from that, and so they did a competition, basically, or a, 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 a contest to figure out who would be the replacement. Um, the, the rule was you had to have graduated from the conservatory to be considered. She had not, and yet she got the job. So again, this speaks to her ability as a performer uh, and as a musician. So she really is a, a, a truly a great name. Um, she continued her radio career for many years up until uh, World War II, when, of course, all radio transmissions stopped. But she, as a result of her radio career, she got to travel around the globe. She traveled all throughout Europe. And she even came to the United States in 1937 to do a couple of concerts on the radio. Uh, we know nothing more about them other than they happened uh, and that she was here, and she was a huge success. She only wrote two pieces for her beloved instrument, um, the Ombres, which is a suite for the Passion of Christ, which you're going to hear uh, none of uh, today. Um, but it's a six-movement sort of set of pieces where she talks about various scenes of the experience of Christ's life. So it's before the crowd, at Golgotha, at the tomb, and so on and so forth. The second piece uh, that I'm going to play for you now is a set of theme and variations that she wrote on a famous French tune, uh, which took me many years to find... The, the actual source of, because the French have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Noels, based by region and et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, finally found it. Anyway, uh, so the theme is, theme is very simple, very sweet and charming, 
And the first variation you're gonna hear sounds very much like the music of Claude Debussy with a lot of sort of parallel chords that don't have a lot of harmonic connection. And then I'll play the last movement, the final toccata, which is a tribute to her teacher, Marcel Dupre. First variation. I just want to warn you, the final toccata is really very modern sound. Thank you for enduring and hope you enjoy meeting these four wonderful women who should be better known. Any questions? I I'm sure if I'm invited to, I'm always happy to do that kind of thing. <laughs> I love to talk. I have nothing, nothing scheduled at the moment. So. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> Chris. Um, the reason Martha is my favorite is because she's the first one I found. Um, so she's near and dear to my heart for that reason. Uh, and she, was, she came out of my dissertation research. That's why I thought it was happening out of this. Um, I think things are way better than they used to be. 
Uh, I mean, for, for women in general, they're not still what they should be, there's still no equitization, but I think every, everybody I know uh, is working really hard to make sure that women are equally represented in everything they do. The American Guild of Organists, to which I belong, uh, had a Sunday in May, Women Composers Sunday, and that Sunday I happened to play the Boule piece and some other pieces by women. So, and they asked me to post that on social media. So it really d is getting out there. And uh, I think, you know, we're getting way better about this than we used to be. So I think it's, it's, it's changing for the better. <laughs> Always. Yes, sir. That's great. That's great. Yeah, nice. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Um, what do you think, um, and I think I might know the answer to this, <laughs> what do you think prevented these women from being published? Well, it's a combination of things, I think. First of all, uh, when, when Boulay's first pieces were published, they wouldn't put her name on, they only put her first initial. It was just, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was the glass ceiling kind of thing. It was very, everything was male dominated, right? I mean, the church was male dominated, government was male dominated, education was male dominated. Uh, everything was that way. And they just didn't think that a woman composer would sell. Right, um, because um, I, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, I'm speaking to the expert. I mean, this is saying, we think that some of the musical compositions of Robert Schumann were indeed written by his wife, Caroline. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, and also, if you, if, for those of you who know the history of the Bronte sisters, yes. Emily, um, Charlotte, and Anne, and they all had to publish under male names. Exactly. Courier Acton, Courier Acton and Bell, or they would not have been published. Exactly. You know, so it's a long history of, I hate to say it, misogyny in yeah. music. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so who knows? I mean, and I'm, I would notice I just saw the initial check. Yes, right. And that was the original publication. That's how it was. They recently republished it, reprinted it, and they put her full name. But that's just, again, the past decade. Right? So it's been a long time coming. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.